Um, my name is Sam Ely. Um, so I work with uh, Percival Engineering. I've been with that firm since it started. Um, um, I'm going to give you a presentation on binary, um, reverse engineering, binary file analysis. This is going to be pretty useful tomorrow during the uh, capture the flag portion. Um, reverse engineering is, is kind of a mindset. I mean, that's the kind of thing that you can work on for six months, a year, two years, three years, and you're continually finding different tricks um, and techniques to pull this off. Uh, today, I'm going to be going through and, and kind of giving you a real quick crash course on really the preparation of a binary file and some just off the, off the, uh, off the rail tools that you can use to analyze these files really quickly um, to get some good information out of those. Um, all leveraging open source tools, all leveraging techniques that, um, you know, we did not pioneer, but we, we leverage heavily. Um, so um, hopefully you guys find this entertaining and uh, engaging. I'll be monitoring the chat window to see if we have any questions along the way. All right. So, um, so the goal of this is to understand where do you get binaries as we go through and do binary analysis. You got to get a binary. That's half the challenge in a lot of these cases. Uh, the next is what do you do with these binaries when you get them? How, do, there's preparation that needs to be done. There's manipulation, transformations that need to be applied to them often. Um, so really just um, some of the tools and techniques. And then I'll, I'll show quickly how to load this into Ghidra. Um, this is not a Ghidra course. Again, I, we, I can put a week or two together on reverse engineering and tricks you can do in Ghidra and Ida Pro and a handful of other tools like that. That's not what this is about. Um, this is a really quick uh, crash course on basically the manipulation of a binary file and uh, what you can do with that once you have those together. So um, first of all, like what is a binary file? Um, so, looks like some of the finding got moved up around here, but when we're talking about a binary file, um, these are files that, that typically are they're not source code, they're not something human readable. Um, this is what a processor um, or a chip or, or some sort of device are going to execute or they're going to manipulate. Um, so, it's typically machine readable information um, that is leveraged. It can be like data, um, but it, typically what I'm talking about here are firmware files or binary images. Um, so um, firmware, uh, firmware, the difference between there's software, there's firmware, there's hardware. Hardware are things you can touch and feel, software are things that are typically uploaded and, and put on hardware. So your traditional thing would be an application or whatnot. Firmware is somewhere in the middle um, and what it really refers to is executables that are placed inside of an embedded system. So these are things, are, are devices that are typically not changed. So in your computer, this might be a BIOS, this might be things that boot up as a process gets going before it loads into the operating system. On things like a router, it might be the entire operating system in, in image. Um, for things like EP SCADA devices and protection relays and, and, thing, and, route and RTUs and whatnot, um, the firmware is typically a single image that that device loads up puts into memory and then executes out of. It can contain file systems. It can contain a whole lot of stuff in this one thing that we refer to as firmware. Um, so it's really anything that provides that low-level control for hardware. Um, for embedded systems, sometimes it never gets past low-level control and it includes everything. Um, that, that's sort of what we're talking about. Um, um, so some of the main phases um, when we're dealing with binary manipulation and analysis, um, well, first, got to go get that binary. Um, sometimes that's half the battle. Uh, we have to do a little bit of manipulation, potentially uh, pretty heavy manipulation into it. And then finally, we finish up with some binary reversing, um, where you would actually load that into Ghidra and do some, some rather cool stuff with it. Acquisition. Um, yeah, download from the vendor. How easy is that? Um, well. More often than not, um, even the files that are placed out by the vendor for you to download are not in a format or not a complete image or they're just not everything you need in order to do the job. Um, you can copy it from the device. <coughs> so um, some of these devices run embedded Linux or some sort of operating system that has an interactive capability. You can log into it and tinker with it as though it's a computer. Um, in those cases, you can try to pull information off of the device. Um, but Often what you're getting is the in-memory loaded version of that that 
that firmware or that binary image. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, there, often there's one file that contains all of the information. It's got the bootloader, it's got the file partition, it's got all the, the OS levels, it's got all the drivers, it has the not only the initial bootloader, but it's got the main OS. And at various times as that system boots up, it might grab that image, um, leverage um, code that's running on the, that device to read that image to pull off a portion that it executes. That gets loaded into memory and executed. That portion that gets executed then reads more from that file and loads that into memory and executed. And, and often it, it actually steps over top of its own image as it, it gets going and kind of replaces things as it kind of goes to a, a, an initial, then a next stage, and a next stage, and a next stage. Um, it's not uncommon to have two or three stages of loading in, in embedded systems like, like what we're talking about here. Um, so copying from a device often does not give you that raw data. It might give you enough, though, that you can recreate that system and get it up and running. And, and that's, that can be a challenge. Um, you can snoop bus traffic, so a lot of these devices, you can put a, um, a JTAG on it, or you can put a, uh, you know, various tools like a bus pirate or something like that on it um, that would allow you to look at traffic that's flowing between the chips and the processor and collect that data off. Um, you can certainly do that. Um, that, again, is a little challenging because you're looking at traffic as it flows across the bus. You're not necessarily able to manipulate the bus, so there, there's... That brings about other problems um, and other challenges. Um, desoldering or reading the flash chip. Um, if this is an option, often this is the easiest because um, when you read that off that chip, that is an image. That is exactly what the system is running. It includes everything that's on there. Um, sometimes this isn't feasible. Oftentimes this is destructive. Um, so it, it may or may not be an option for you. Most cases, the easiest is to download from that vendor and fingers crossed that what the vendor provides you is the complete um, capability for you to analyze. All right. Has anybody had any, uh, any successes um, for, for uh, desoldering or reading flash chips? Is, um, again, this is, this is one that um, is typically a, almost always works like this approach. Uh, it does require somebody with some technical skills. You know, you might have a heat gun or something like that to pull that off and, and play with it. Um, so there was a question about what are the, the snooping tools. Um, it's not quite as easy as it sounds, so this might be attaching a logic analyzer um, to a device that you can read bus traffic as it flows across and engaging with it. Um, it's a logic analyzer. It's a discrete lab uh, or test equipment you would have to go out and purchase or find in one of your labs and, and attach to it. Um, JTAG might be another one that would allow you to do this. So if, if there's JTAG ports or BDM ports, depending on the architecture, um, you know, often we'll look at a system and we'll see like a, where a header should go, but it's not populated. We'll solder on a header and we'll probe around and we'll find out what the debugging ports are and we'll leverage that to dump memory off of a system. Um, that's pretty useful. All right, that's a great question. Any other questions? All right, so, so now that we have this image, you went out to the web and we pulled this thing down or, or we pulled it off of the uh, flash chip itself um, and we saved that out to some file. Um, now we have to do things to it in order to get some, some sort of data or intelligence out of this. Um, so depending on how you acquired this, um, it may and is often malformed. Um, so if it's a firmware image that's downloaded off of a vendor website, they often put headers on top of those images that tell um, the embedded system how to process it and load that into memory. So for example, let's say there's a firmware file and that firmware update only needs to update um, you know, a, a very small a driver for a certain thing that's loaded into memory. Well, that header is gonna say, well, this firmware update, load into this location in memory and overwrite this, um, and then don't forget to reboot when you're done to apply it. Um, it also might be, uh, this is a large image that's going to replace everything, so load that into RAM and then overwrite it. So all of those instructions are, are often applied to these firmware images that a, an OEM or a vendor will prepend to that, that image and kind of pack together all the various portions. Um, byte swapping, um, so, so you think little any and big Indian for you programmer types or hardware engineers where you know the least significant byte and the big, most significant byte Sometimes that's what we're referring to, but that, that's not really what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about in these cases. 
Um, so if you pull memory off of a, a chip, so let's we go out and we desolder that chip and we put it into a, uh, a reader. Um, often there's more than one chip and those things are typically byte interleaved. So odd bytes go in this chip and even bytes go in that other chip. And so when we dump this memory, often this memory is it's just kind of mangled across or distributed across the various chips um, the EEPROM or flash chips that are on board the, bo the system. Um, well, that needs to be unmangled. It needs to be combined back up into the right way. And so what you'll often get would be byte swapping, um, where on the bytes, they're actually swapped. So instead of the being T-H-E, it would be H-T-E, or actually H-T space E. So, to, you know, the space, that's how it would kind of lay out. So if you pull thing, tools like strings and you start looking at it, and you're like, looks kind of like a word, but it, it, it's weird. Uh, often that means that the system is byte swapped and we have to do some cleanup on that. Um, compression, that's very, very common. Um, you know, these flash devices, they don't have a lot of RAM, they don't have a lot of storage, so they'll, they'll compress a lot of stuff. Um, they typically use things like uh, Zlib or sometimes um, uh, Gzip. Um, not too often do you get things like, you know, 7-zip formats, or regular zip. So they're, they're typically uh, compression schemas that are stream focused, that are very much pretty easy to read. They don't require a lot of processing and are typically um, optimized for reading. Um, and that's important because firmware is, is almost never written. It's almost always read off of a device. Um, they don't use the, the EE proms as as a slack space for them to write on. Often these things are written to memory and just never, never manipulated again. Um, and so when they apply compression to those, um, those compression schemas are very much read optimized. Um, and if you, if you find that interesting, there's a whole, a whole analysis you can find on lots of literature out there on open source about, you know, the, the trade-offs between compression ratios, the trade-offs between speed for reading, for writing. Um, is it in place? Um, decompression, what are the memory requirements? There's a lot of trade-offs that go on, uh, but often it rolls back to bzip, um, sometimes gzip, um, sometimes zlib are, are the three that you typically see with uh, firmware images. Um, and then you start getting into packing and padding. Um, so I kind of alluded to earlier how um, various um, firmware images, they're, they're not so simple like, well, just take this image and dump it on the EEPROM or the flash chip of this device. That, that's typically not what happens. They typically put a header and they typically put information about what to do with it. They'll compress it, a, an image, but that compressed image isn't going to be put on the EEPROM. That needs to be decompressed and loaded in there. And Often they'll pre-pin this with a, with a size of the compressed image and where to load it into memory and what to do with it. So all of that sort of information is put into those headers. And then the files themselves would be packed. So they want to keep these firmware images as small as they can. And so they'll, they'll slap them together in a consecutive blocks, one right after the other. So this might be a firmware image or a EEPROM update. Immediately thereafter would be a file system that's compressed using something else. And immediately thereafter would be something else. Um, sometimes they put in padding where they'll you know pad it out to the nearest block of memory or nearest uh, section to make sure that things don't start on weird odd boundaries and whatnot. All of these sort of things are challenges if you're looking at a binary file and you're really trying to get inside of it and take a look. <clears throat> all right, so yeah, all of these things, challenges we have to go through and take a look. So um, tools you can use. Um, all right, um, somebody asked me earlier, um, not, not but a couple months ago, like what are the tools we use initially to look for firmware images. I, I think it was one of the universities we were given a presentation to, and it's like, right out of the gate, strings. Um, almost immediately the first thing I do when I get a funky weird file, I don't know what it is, it's just run it through strings. Um, strings is great because if there, if anything in there that is uncompressed, that is, is readable, you can get copyright strings, you can get architecture strings, um, you can get some notes about how things are compiled. There's a lot of data that will come across um, just by taking a look at strings. And if nothing else, it tells you that the file has been processed correctly. So again, that example about the being, being stored in memory as HT space E, that lets you know that, yeah, it's, it, it's an ASCII 
string, but it's not an ASCII word. You can take a look at that and your brain immediately says, that's not right, I need to fix this. Um, XSD is a great way to dump hex um, file. Um, really great tool, you just give it a binary thing and say, what is this? You can give it an ELF file or, or an executable and it'll tell you the architecture, it'll tell you the, um, the, the platform often that it's loaded into. Um, grep is another great thing, so if you're searching for various things that you want to find, tree is another great way to kind of get a representation of the system. Um, your head and your tail tools, the really great things about if I wanted to take a look at a file and I want to, you know, get the first 30 strings, um, I, can, I can pipe those through tail and I can, I can do some things, uh, sort and whatnot. Um, DD, um, so this digital dump or disk dump utility, um, it's used a lot for binary backups of systems, but we use it a lot for processing files. So when files are packed together and there's a, a compressed thing here and there's a tarball here and there's a file system there and there's a whatever there, you can use DD to pull out those little snippets into separate files and process those individually. Um, Binwalk, uh, Binwalk is an amazing tool. Um, there's a dev TTYS0 is the guy who wrote it, that's his handle. Um, it is a great, great tool for these sort of systems. Um, often what Binwalk does is it takes everything that I just described and puts it together into a single tool that allows you to do things, um, do some analysis, and even extraction of files um, just on the command line. It really lowers the bar of entry um, for a lot of these things. So uh, if there was one thing out of this entire list that I would recommend you read the man page up on and get familiar with, it would be Binwalk. Um, it's open source tool, you can download it um, and bring it right in. Um, truncate, good way to drop off files. So again, if you know that this file is only supposed to be a thousand bytes, but it's been padded out to a thousand twenty-four, just chop off that twenty-four. Um, DD, that 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 dumping utility, it also does manipulation. So you can tell it to skip, you can tell it so you can pull out little snippets in the middle of a file. You can actually tell it to do byte swapping. So this SWAB command is convert a file and swipe on the swap on the byte. Um, really useful, um, and I believe you might need to know this um, for tomorrow's CTF event. So um, for all these paying attention, that's a good one. Uh, tar UNXZ bin, um, again Binwalk has a lot of this uh, compression and extraction capability in it. Um, prior to Binwalk, we would literally need to go through and say, what is this file? And we would run strings on it. We type the file command. We would load it into Ghidra. We take a look and look for pre, uh, preambles, pull entropy to try to figure out what's going on. And then we would try various extraction tools and techniques into it. Um, well, Binwalk does all of that for you and kind of automates it. So um, again, if there was one tool out of this entire setup, I would recommend you get familiar with, um, it would be Binwalk. Um, I'm going to pause here see if there's any questions. Has anybody had any experience with Binwalk? All right, got a couple people. That's excellent. Um, uh, yeah, it, in, there, there are uh, like various um, file system support that you can pull into Binwalk. So Binwalk itself sometimes doesn't bring in like SquashFS or our Jefferson file system or some of these weird funky little file systems that you will only hear about when you're looking at binary files for embedded systems on firmware images. Um, so uh, those would be really uh, I don't believe you're going to need those for the CTF event, but if you're doing this on future efforts and it comes across and says SquashFS and Binwalk throws its hands up and says, I don't know what to do, uh, actually Binwalk does support it. You just need to go down and pull in that plugin and, and, and get it into it. So um, you know, I, I can't talk enough about Binwalk. It's a fantastic tool. It's, it is the Swiss Army knife. When it works, it works really well. When it doesn't work, it brings you right back to what I just described earlier where you're having to manually go through the the DD tools and the conversion tools and all the other processing itself. All right, so now that we got that image, we brought it down, we manipulated it, we got all the bytes swapped and we have all of the, um, the, the tarballs extracted out of it. And we've identified that it's a file and we've identified this as a bootloader and we've identified this as U-boot and all these other things. Now what? Um, so this is where binary reverse engineering kind of comes in. Um, 
So IDO Pro used to be the tool that everybody was familiar with and everybody used. Um, it's still there, it is still fantastic. Um, however, NSA released this, and it was a tool that was a government developed tool called Ghidra. Um, they released that to the open source community a couple years back. Um, it's free. IDO Pro is not free. Um, IDO Pro is about 2,000 bucks a year. Um, it does have decompilers that you can add to it, and those are a couple thousand dollars on top of it. IDO Pro is, is a fantastic tool. Um, Ghidra is, does most of all of that stuff and is absolutely free. The other real benefit to Ghidra and why um, I love it a lot is that it, it, the one thing that IDA Pro does not do well is it does not allow you to collaborate on an effort. Um, there is not an easy way for you to have two people working on the same images and share notes and take the work that, that Jill did and apply that to your work and, and take what you know, all these other people are doing and merge those together into one product. Um, IDA Pro, unfortunately, you have to save a file and you hand the file to somebody else and then you can open it up and it, it's, it's a very manual, tedious process. Uh, Ghidra, I, I effectively, it's a version behind the scenes is what it looks like. You check in changes and it merges stuff together and it, it'll diff things and if there's a conflict, it'll pop it up and it is a really cool way for having multiple people work on a project and then to share the results with other people. Um, so uh, Ghidra, if, if I were to pick one out of these two, I would say if, if you're not familiar with Ida and Ghidra and you haven't kind of settled in on your favorite, I would recommend you stick with Ghidra. I think you're going to find that the market share is just going to drive larger and larger towards that. Um, Radar, uh, Binary Ninja, there's, um, there's uh, Chef, I think Binary Chef. There's there's a handful of different tools out there that let you pull in files and manipulate files and kind of analyze entropy and, and, and chunk and slice things in various ways. Um, they're, they're really cool. Um, so, you know, there's a question on what do I think of Cutter. Um, uh, there, there's so many tools out there to look at. Uh, they all have their unique things that make them special. They're, they all have their, their things that make them um, really good. And really what it comes down to is, um, you know, Victoria, as you build up your repertoire of tools that you like to use, that you kind of go back to, you're going to have your toolkit. Um, and it's the toolkit that you are using or your team typically uses. So if Cutter is your preference over Binary Ninja, then by all means, take Cutter and run with them. Um, but over time, you're going to kind of settle in on the set of tools that you like to use that you always go back to. Um, so if, if, you, if you've been in this industry for a while, you're probably an IDA Pro person. Um, and so the thought of having to learn Ghidra, you would think is annoying because the buttons are different and the way it does things is different. It just takes so long to do analysis, whereas you can drop files into IDA and make them happy immediately. Um, if you haven't really been in this industry yet and uh, you're starting out and you go into Ghidra and you're like, Ghidra is amazing and then you full IDA Pro and you're like, it doesn't include a compiler, a decompiler, it doesn't include this, it doesn't include these different architectures, um, you'll be frustrated the other way. And so it's 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 a little bit of like the Microsoft and Linux. There's haters on both sides of that equation. At the end of the day, the two products work really well. Um, they both are able to achieve whatever you need. Um, Binary Ninja, right? all of these tools have things that they specialize in that make them just a little bit better in one area or other, but you typically can make it work um, through any of them. So um, I, I, don't, I don't hate on any of these tools. I think all of them have a place. Um, I would recommend, like, get familiar with them, build up that, that experience and familiarity and stick with whatever works for you. Um, that said, some of these tools, um, um, we start to get into CPU architecture specific things. And so if we're dealing with a disassembler, if we're dealing with binary files, um, if it's a PowerPC, then you need the IDA Pro with the PowerPC support and the decompiler for PowerPC. If you're dealing with Ghidra, um, it's got a whole bunch of, of built-in processor modules that just support a ton of different architectures. Um, so typically, if it's not your x86 and it's not your really common ARM, um, you're gonna, and it's a, a little bit more funky of an architecture, which IoT devices and, and EP SCADA systems typically are a little bit more funky um, to architectures. Ghidra is going to probably work out more in your favor um, just because it has more of that support in it. Um, so, um, and, and um, I'll, I'll get off the Ghidra bandwagon here, but yeah, the, 
Chris mentioned, there's a ton of open source plugins and things. So if you are looking at it and you're coming across a problem, you're like, man, it would be really great if it was a way to like highlight this section and have it decompress and pull the thing out. Yeah, there's a plugin for that. Go out to um, GitHub, do a couple searches. Somebody gets written it. Um, and just pull in those plugins and make it happen. It also has Python and all, all kinds of other stuff. So does Ida Pro. It's got Python APIs and plugins. So, um, you know, they both work really well. Pick whatever works best for you. But um, one of the biggest challenges is before you can really get in and do any binary reversing, you need to understand the language that that binary is built in. So the first step there is to understand the CPU architecture. Um, so CPU architecture, what I'm meaning by that is, is it x86? If so, is it x64 or is it x86? Um, you know, is, is your ARM, ARM v7, v9, v8, is it little Indian, big Indian? Like, what is that architecture and platform? Um, because you need to get the tools configured correctly. When you bring things into Ghidra, it's going to ask you right out of the gate, what's the architecture of this thing? What's the platform? What's the compiler even it asks? Because Borland does things different from GCC. Yes, I said Borland. Um, does different than GCC, does different some from Visual Studio. They do just things a little bit different. You can optimize the way your disassembler and decompilers work if you know the, that information. Um, I talked about how Binwalk does a great job of analyzing files and, and it does a lot of these things for you. Binwalk dash capital A. If you give it a file that is properly extracted, decompressed, um, and, and ready for you to look at, the bytes are all swapped and everything, Binwalk-A um, will take a look at it, scans for different opcodes, and goes, oh, that's, that's a jump instruction. And I see a whole bunch of those jump instructions or, or whatever it uses for its signature. That's x86 or that's ARM or that's whatever. And it kind of does that. Um, it's a little unreliable. Um, and the challenge here is when you're looking at opcodes, um, opcodes are binary representations or instructions for the, the computer to look at. There's a ton of false positives. Right, so um, like when you, if you run strings <clears throat> on a binary file, you're gonna get a whole bunch of what looks like just gibberish, weird ampersands, ASCII things, um, exclamation point. That's because it's an opcode that happens to be ASCII readable, that happens to have a zero at the end, so it looks null terminated. So strings thinks that's a word and pulls that string out. When in reality, it's just an opcode, it's an instruction for the processor to execute. So you'll get a lot of these false positives um, with Binwalk. Um, still a good tool, but just you know, take that with a grain of salt. Um, the best way is to look at it, um, to take a look at these systems, extract files out. <coughs> when you extract these files out, um, open them up, analyze them. Like if you're able to get an ELF executable, <coughs> run file against that ELF, it's going to come right out and tell you. MIPS, architecture, whatever, 64, 32, 16, but whatever it is, it's going to tell you right out of the thing because that, that ELF has that encoded into the header. It literally tells you exactly what it is. Um, you can also, if you get um, Linux files, um, you get a file system, you can go into the file system and analyze and, and look for things. Um, yeah, yes, Chris, I'll, I'll show you real, real quick. I'll get into a, a demo here in a second. It's actually, I believe, the next slide. Um, um, strings, again, um, strings is a super powerful tool. Um, you know, we're all, we're, we're not machines, we're humans, we have uh, some more intuition than computers do. We're able to look at things and our brain does a much better job of saying, I recognize that and I see that pattern, I know what this is. And so you, your brain can quickly look at a list of strings or a list of things and very quickly say, yep, that's useful to me, that's not. Um, so like GCC compiler settings are often saved into an executable and you can just take a look at those. The names of libraries that are brought in are typically in clear text. You can just look at those and you, you can immediately find out information about this binary. Um, grep, grep's another way. So grep for PPC or grep for MIPS or grep for ARM and let's just see what happens. And you'll often get strings and they'll come back and, and you, know, you can look at that right away and say, yep, sure enough, that's what I'm looking for. Um, so if you find these things, especially that ELF or the, like the kconfig file, they are very, very reliable. Um, you just have to dig to find them. Um, of course, another thing you can do is just pull up some spec sheets. So if you have a board um, and you know that it's running a, 
a Marvel chip or an ARM chip or whatever chip, and you can pull the data spec on on this on the board itself. Um, or the manufacturer oftentimes will have a tech spec at the end of their data sheet, and it'll be back there, and it'll say this is running on um, eight gigs of RAM and 16 gigs of EEPROM, and by the way, it's an ARM whatever it is processor. Um, Super, super easy if that information is there. Um, so always look for documentation on these systems before you start spending a lot of time on them. Um, you'll, you'll save yourself a lot of trouble. All right, um, any questions on this? All right, so um, I'm gonna give you a quick run through of, of like what you can do loading things into Ghidra and, and manipulating those, um, a quick little tool Tool sheet. I think I have my, uh, my name is paper. Um, I have a, a couple walkthroughs. Um, the slides have this, these materials posted at the end, so I would recommend that you take a look at those, but um, we're going to shift over to the interactive portion if we don't have any other questions. All right, can everybody see this? Um, looks like a Kali Linux window. All yes, right. we can see it. So this is, in fact, a Kali Linux window. Um, this is very similar to the setup that you all will be uh, um, having available to you when you are um, working on the CTF event tomorrow. Um, in here, we have a couple different files. Um, I have a, a flash image. I have a, a, just a random ROM. Um, here's another random file. Just a handful of different things in here. And what I'm going to do is just kind of walk you through um, some tools and different techniques you can use on these. So first and foremost, um, you can literally just run file on these commands and you'll, you'll get some information out of them. So that ROM file, turns out that's a POSIX tar, so don't trust file extensions, um, right? That's, that's one of the first things that I would recommend on this. Um, but you know, if some of them are pretty obvious, they're probably pretty obvious. So like an XZ compressed file probably ends in XZ, so you can look at those. Um, you'll also get, if file doesn't really understand it because if you understand how the file command works, what it does is it looks for, uh, they call them magic bytes, but like the first two or four bytes of a file and tries to match them up. So in the first couple bytes of a tar file literally says tar. The first couple bytes of a PK zip file says PK. Um, you know, they're, you know, engineers are pretty lazy. They like their tools to work. So that's a quick way of making sure that a file works before it processes them. That's our advantage. The command file looks at those magic bytes and tries to identify them. Um, but it, it does, the file command ignores file extension. It literally just looks for those bytes. So it's a really great way for you to go through and kind of take a look at this. Um, I mentioned this binwalk tool. Um, you know, binwalk, if you take a look at it, it's got a whole bunch of different features. There's swapping bytes in here. There's diffing files. You can run entropy on this. You can run a lot of deep analysis. There's this nice extract feature. You should probably pay attention to that. Um, you know, but there's a lot of different ways this um, binwalk dash capital B effectively runs file against it and tells you what's going on for files. So a lot of these command line tools have just been added to it and, and kind of wrapped into this one tool um, to make work. So if we were to run binwalk, um, I can type against that flash image. It comes back and says it's a gzip file, um, right? So somewhat useful. It, well, it found a portion of the file at this offset in the file that happens to be gzipped. Um, and then it's got some funky, weird date. So when you start to see bogus data dropping out of this, you start to look at this and you're like, oh, the grain of salt. Did it really find a gzip compressed section or did it, it found something it thinks is gzip and it just wasn't able to, to process it? Um, so it's kind of useful, but you know it has some challenges. 
Um, well, if you run strings on this image, our flash image, right? These are all the weird opcodes that are focused in it. You also get a lot of compression, and that compression uh, looks like um, just random bytes because it is. Then you start to see things like this. Um, so this should sort of almost immediately throw up in your head. It's like, that kind of looks like a word, but it doesn't look like English to me. That looks like a file path, but it doesn't look like it's right. Something's weird about this. There's capitals in here to make the words seem like they are. G, period, T, what's going on here, right? You could look at this and you're like, ah, it, just, it just doesn't look right. Um, well, this is an indicator that it's probably byte swapped. Um, so what you would want to do is, is go through and unbyte swap it. Um, I've, I've already done this for you, but is that screen blurry? Is it coming in here? A little bit, but not too bad. That's good. How is it? Swap B. I don't think it is. Now, when I run strings on white swapped, let's see if that looks a little bit better at the end. Oh, yeah, look at that. So again, um, this is a, a quick way to kind of look at it, and um, and you know you, your brain again can look at that those characters at the end, and it's going to look at it and go, "Something's weird," but it looks like it could be words, but it's just not right. Um, you can try to byte swap it, unbyte swap it in your head, and figure things out. I, I will tell you, you will go mad trying to do that. It makes more sense just to throw it at one of these commands and try byte swapped or try short swapped is another one that sometimes you'll see as things are swapped on the short. Um, just run that at it and take a look at the file and see what happens. So now that I've, I've done this, um, now you can use like bin walk um, on byte swapped and say, now what do you see? Now that I've fixed the byte swap, it found gzips at certain offsets. It found a whole bunch of other things in this system because I, I've kind of unmangled, unpacked, and unmanipulated it to a point where it's now pseudo-readable. Um, all right, so making swim, or so why would images be byte swapped? So um, often what happens is the, the file image is made by the manufacturer and it's intended to be loaded into memory um, by, the, by the device itself. Um, You'll get some weird, funky byte swapping depending on how it's saved. Sometimes we'll do that, but more often than not, it's an indicator that the, the actual memory on the box is, is, is byte swapped. So, and what I mean by that is um, when you build, if, if you have any computer architecture or hardware kind of people and they're designing a board, um, if they can fit all the, the RAM into one chip, they'll put that one chip and it's typically a uh, nice, clean, contiguous, you know, address zero all the way forward. Um, but if you don't, and you need more memory than a single EEPROM chip will do, you'll have two of them, right? And when you have two of those things, what happens is um, you'll take one of those address lines and you'll tie an address, like the odd address line to this chip and the even address line to that chip. And so as it writes, it just writes between the two chips back and forth. And so because of that, you'll get weird byte swapping. You'll get weird formats of data. And what we have to do is we have to undo that in order to get that memory. Um, so yeah, uh, converse swab, like, the, I mean, their DD will do this with the convert swab. Um, um, Binwalk also does this, uh, binary niche. There are a handful of these different tools will do that. A lot of these tools have packaged up um, these features together um, for you to make it a little easier on you. But, you know, they, it, it is there for you. Um, but really cool thing about uh, bin walk. So the, the, the dash me, um, 
dash me, uh, the capital M means Metrioshka or Metroshka, um, E means extract. And what that means is it's going to grab everything that it recognizes at our first pass. Go ahead and extract that out. It's then going to look at every single file it, it extracted and, tr and analyze that and try to extract again and dump those files out. And it just keeps doing this until it can't find any more files. This can take a little bit of time as it goes through and it's extracting a whole bunch of files now. It's pulling out all kinds of data that's out there. Um, and when it's done, um, Binwalk is really nice in that it gives you this byte swapped, and I've done this twice, that's why there's two folders here, um, extracted folder. In here, it found this um, arch directory and it also found a zip file. So you can go into the arch. What did it find in here? It found some zip or PDFs. It also found this um, a bin file. So we can go into that bin file, look in here more. Looks like it's a bunch of binaries. Oh, there's a file system. Let's go into the file system. Look at that, we have bin, we have data, we have all these various things. And so what it's done is it, it, round, it, un, it extracted the first set of files, it looked at those files, tried to extract again, looked at those files, tried to extract again, and just kept going and going and going and going. Um, now that you're here, you can do some really cool stuff. So if you go over to the bin directory, these are the binaries that would be running on this device. Now if you run file against them and you pick a box, like BusyBox, it's going to come right out and tell you some stuff. It's an ELF, um, it tells you the, the significant byte order, it's a 32-bit, um, it's a MIPS, the version of the MIPS, how it was linked, what the lib is that it was pieced together. All of this stuff um, has features built into it, so um, it can be really, really useful. Um, uh, yeah, it, Lauren, it would be good to know this. I think this might come in handy tomorrow for the CTF event. All right, um, and then from here, um, you know, you can you can dig around and try to find various settings, um, like. There's a lot of stuff in here that you can kind of manipulate around. Um, there's shadow files, there's password files, there's Etsy files, all kinds of little features that are going to be kind of nice for you if you're trying to analyze, um, analyze the system. All right. So I think that's about as far as I wanted to get into the demo. Um, again, there's so many features in Binwalk. This is not a, um, uh, I'm not going to make you an expert at Binwalk. Uh, this is intended to kind of give you some different tools and kind of walk you through a, a one quick example. Um, this example and a couple other things that are in there are actually in, um, in, the, in the PowerPoint slides. We have backup files that kind of have this as a walkthrough. So when those get posted, it's a great reference for you to pull back on. Um, type history. You want to know what I've typed, huh? Careful. All right. Um, does anybody have any any questions or anything I can answer? So Binwalk is actively maintained. Um, so um, these newer versions may be including um, support for file systems out of the box. If not, when you check them out and build it, you can include those. Um, So I believe these sessions are being recorded, um, and um, at least it doesn't appear blurry on this end. So let's hope that the video recordings come out clear. If they don't, we might just re-record this and try to get a, a more clear one out. Um, but again, the the look at the PowerPoint slides that I that are attached. Those PowerPoint slides um, have these examples. They have a lot of the commands that I just walked through and put in front of you. Yeah, and uh, we'll make those available. Um, including the slides and everything will be up later this evening so you guys could reference this material back. Um, yeah, thanks, Sam. That was fantastic. No worries. Well, thanks, guys. Looking forward to uh, seeing you guys do the CTF tomorrow. All right, thanks. Yep. yep. Hope you remember those, some of those commands, guys. Sorry, go ahead, Tina. I think that was you. I just said thank you, Sam. That's great.